Aged care is an area of health care where much of the regulation and funding comes from the Commonwealth, although managing the outbreak on the ground, at least, is a matter for the state. That might in part explain the crisis we're seeing play out in Victoria. Senator Richard Colbeck is the Federal Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians. He joins me now from Tasmania. Senator Colbeck, thank you very much for your time. I know uh, you're one of the busiest people in the, in the country at the moment looking into this virus, particularly in Victoria. I just don't understand. We saw how this played out in Sydney with Newmarch House back in April. Why Victorian aged care facilities weren't better prepared? Well, uh, evening, Peter. It's been a pretty difficult couple of weeks in Victoria, as we've seen. But I don't think that... Um, well, I know that we've learned a lot of lessons from what we saw in New South Wales, particularly Dorothy Henderson Lodge and Newmarch. And uh, that's uh, facilitated us acting very, very quickly in response to the circumstances that we found. But what we did see in, um, in Sydney at Newmarch or DHL was a circumstance that we found at St Basil's where every single worker, both administration and, and a care worker, within the facility were declared as either COVID positive or close contacts, which meant that we had a circumstance where we had to go in with a completely new team who didn't know the residents, who didn't know the layout of the facility, and effectively in an overnight situation, uh, set up a new team, uh, set up new communications for uh, getting information out to families. Uh, it's been a very, very trying and difficult circumstance, including a situation where there's a lot of people who've are very reluctant to work in a COVID-infected environment. So it's been very, very testing. It's, uh, it's tested all of our systems uh, and uh, placed a lot of stress on the people involved, uh, including, unfortunately, the, a tragic impact on many families. I want to ask you about the protocols for treating COVID-positive aged care residents. I've got a number of contacts who work in aged care in Victoria and in a couple of the big hospitals, and I understand talking to them and reading what I can read elsewhere, uh, that it's a case-by-case -case assessment as to who goes to a hospital for treatment uh, with COVID-19 and who remains in a facility. Why are people not routinely moved to a hospital to get better? Obviously, it's better for them presumably, and it's obviously better for limiting the risk of further infection in the aged care facility, isn't it? Well, it is treated on a case-by-case -case basis, and if a, if a resident clinically needs to go to hospital, they will go to hospital. But there are also some other factors that we have to consider. So if you look at the facility at Menorock, for example, it was shared bathrooms, it was shared uh, bedrooms, and it was effectively not possible for us to properly isolate and cohort the people within the facility. So what we did there was to take everybody out, to decant the facility completely. Uh, it's had been through a deep cleaning process, and now we're working through the cycle of uh, staff being able to return to the facility and be prepared for residents to come back. Uh, uh, and, and so that's the process that we're working through. In other circumstances, we've taken residents out to give the facility capacity to properly cohort within the facility, uh, to take mm -hmm. out those that clinically do need to be sent to hospital. Uh, but the residents also have their own wishes and some residents in facilities, including some of the conversations I've been having this afternoon, for example, the residents don't want to leave. Their wishes need to be considered as a part of this, uh, and they are. They are residents within these uh, aged care facilities. It is the place that they live and they have rights in that context and so they have to be respected you, as well. So it's not as simple just as just say, just take there, everybody start. out. You're presumably talking about people that have a living will where they decide that they don't want uh, interventionist medicine if they were to become sick, that do not resuscitate sort of decisions they make when they go into these facilities, I presume. I'm told there's, a, there's COVID wards, particularly in a large a metropolitan hospital here in Melbourne, that have ward areas set up specifically for older people coming from nursing homes. Now, I'm told when the patients are admitted there, they and their families are told that they won't be getting a ventilator. Now, is that the case? I mean, if an older person goes into hospital from a nursing home or, or elsewhere, let's say they're 70, 75 and they want a ventilator, they haven't signed off this do not resuscitation uh, living will, will they get access to a ventilator in Victoria? If they go into a hospital uh, and they require uh, acute care, uh, they should get acute care. There's, 
and from my perspective and from the Commonwealth's perspective, there is no differentiation between anyone else who needs an acute care service and ventilation if that's what their, as you call it, their living will, their advanced care plan says that mm -hmm. they should have. So they should have access to all of those services. They shouldn't be limited in the context of the healthcare services that they receive. I've not heard of that myself, uh, but uh, they should be receiving the appropriate level of clinical care uh, in accordance with their advanced care plan, living will, if you want to call it that, uh, if they go to hospital. So clinical need is one of the key elements determining whether they go to hospital and they should receive all the care that anyone else would get if they do go to hospital. And what about the rights of family members to get up-to-date and appropriate information? There are a lot of concerning reports out of the St Basil's uh, facility where people were saying, well, you know, and I've got some on the screen there, you know, we just want communication, no one's communicating, you're dealing with human lives, people are saying these aren't animals, uh, let us lay our eyes on our loved ones just to know they're OK. What's being done? Is that a uniform view across nursing homes in Victoria or is this just limited to St Basil's? And what's being done to improve communication with families? Yeah, look, it's a very difficult situation at St Basil's. As I said, we had a situation where we came in basically cold uh, without knowing all the residents. Uh, there were some issues with identification within the facility. Uh, we set up very quickly a communications uh, team that were providing messages out on a daily basis to families, and that started on Thursday last week. We had some issues with families not uh, picking up their phones. Uh, there are some issues where there, we, uh, we contact the designated family member uh, and we hope that they would then communicate that information out to the rest of their family. I think there were some mm -hmm. issues with that in some circumstance, and that creates um, angst, uh, and, and that becomes a very difficult situation, so that's hard to manage. Over the weekend, uh, due to the number of inbound calls, we actually set up an inbound call number, and that number was communicated out to all of the designated family members uh, yesterday over the weekend so that if they couldn't, hadn't received the information or missed the call uh, that mm -hmm. was made on an outbound basis, they had a number that they could call in, uh, make an inquiry, and then we would come back to them with information on their families. Communication is vital in this circumstance. If it doesn't happen, uh, it raises angst, uh, and we've seen that in a number of circumstances. I was on a Zoom conference with a number of families, about 70 of them last night. Some of them were very, very anxious. Some of them were frightened, and some of them were were angry and I understand why they would be. Well, Minister, thank you for coming on the show tonight. I think people feel a little bit more confident hearing from you directly and I think they'll be pleased at your, you know, your personal involvement, taking the time to talk to those families last night. I think that's incredibly important. Thank you for your time tonight.